Today, we're taking a zip trip right to your neighborhood grocery store. I'm glad they're here because we need the food. And to your favorite Bay Area restaurant. A sense of consistency, a sense of community, a sense of place. Because we're celebrating all who are keeping us fed during COVID-19. They are being seen in a completely new light. Hey, Brennan, it's Kenji. Uh, I'm making a grilled cheese. Whether preserving our treasured wine country. We have great faith. Our faith is big, but we do have roller coaster moments. Or caring for our most vulnerable neighbors. We're trying to help the needy, the ones that really need this and that's really is struggling. It's all about the food we eat on this KTVU Fox 2 special zip trip, the power of community. Good morning and welcome to The Nine for a special zip trip all about food. Take a look at the line outside Filetti's Foods in San Francisco. Look, they've been in business for almost 70 years there in the Lower Haight District, right by the Panhandle. But the past few months have been unlike anything anyone at Filetti's or really any grocery store has ever seen. Take at all the delicious things. Take a look at all the delicious things waiting for you once you get inside. This is the place to be if you're a big home cook or looking for something quick. We are talking about food and the people behind our food, shining a bright spotlight on everyone who is keeping us fed. We are so glad that you're with us on this special zip trip. Look, normally, of course, we hit the road. We were all over the Bay Area last summer. This summer clearly things are a bit different so I still have my trusty zip trips magnet stolen off the uh, refrigerator and Mike and Sal and Mike I'll start with you I talk a lot about food I'm a big home cook from way back has your approach to mm -hmm. food changed at all over the past three months or so yeah for sure you know I'm very grateful that every time we open the refrigerator I see what is in there and you know uh, throughout the last few months you know for those restaurants that I've had to close you know I feel terrible for those restaurants in our neighborhood um, that are able to stay open, uh, La Toscana, Mi Pueblo. Uh, I'm very grateful that they went to work and were able to provide that still experience of takeout. Look, I mean, when you look at restaurants and grocery stores, this is, you know, seven, eight hundred billion dollar business, millions of employees across the country. And, uh, and Sal, when I think of those individuals getting up in every morning and going to the grocery store to work, uh, the word brave comes to mind because that's what they are. They're brave individuals to even with the gloves on and the mask, they're taking that risk every day so that we can get our you know, essential supplies, but they're taking that risk that they know they could possibly get coronavirus. So uh, my hat's off to all those individuals in the restaurants and the grocery stores who have been there for me and my family. And they're doing it with a smile on their face. Uh, you know, when I go into the store, mm -hmm. everyone's smiling. Uh, they know you by name because I shop there all the time. Uh, they know all the customers by name. So it is really nice to go in and feel part of that community. Now, for many of us, it's been fewer nights out for dinner as well. Mike, you alluded to that. Uh, more takeout, more time in the kitchen mm -hmm. this hour. So Gassia will show us a little more about what home cooking has uh, done. More people are doing some home cooking. and. Uh, Gassi is a good cook, I have to say. I've eaten her food. It's, she's very good. Plus, we will show you how one hyper-local food delivery service is going above and beyond the call of duty. Frank Malicote introduces us to the company that's in it to help both the customer and the restaurant. And we'll chat with San Francisco-based La Cocina. They work with up-and-coming entrepreneurs, especially women of color, to help them build restaurants, bakeries, food trucks, and bars. All right, as we kick off this uh, next zip trip, not entirely as we plan, again, doing it from our homes here, let's take a closer look really at how the food industry right here in the Bay Area has changed over the last few months from grocery stores again to restaurants. Let's bring in KTV's Frank Malicode, who joins us now live uh, to show us how we got here. Frank, good morning. Uh, good morning, Mike. Yeah, I think we can all say it's been quite a journey. Uh, farms, grocery stores, restaurants, I, I think we can all say are essential businesses in our life, but that doesn't mean it's been business as usual. I have never seen, and I've been farming almost 40 years, this kind of uncertainty. From the farms where our food comes from to the grocery stores that sell them. Brave new world, it is, uh, it is interesting and frustrating. And the restaurants that serve some of our favorite meals. This restaurant you're looking at tonight usually is completely full. New rules due to COVID-19 are forcing the food industry to adapt. Most of our takeout, people are coming in and picking it up or we're doing it curbside. But those changes come at a cost. We're down 70%, I would say. 
of the normal business that we do. Also being impacted are food banks with long lines of people, many who just lost their jobs. We are on the front line. I believe when we punch through this coronavirus, I think we will now be considered first responders. And even now, with restrictions slowly being lifted and some economic help on the way, Many say the key to recovery will be the community's support. I'm really uh, looking forward to bringing business back into the city. Uh, I feel terrible for our local businesses that have been suffering. Well, the good news is we're starting to see uh, outdoor dining pick up and we're moving in a good direction. Outdoor dining now allowed in uh, every county here in the Bay Area, but one San Francisco, by the way, will begin outdoor dining today. Alameda County, which has the most cases of COVID-19, has yet to determine a date. That's the latest. I'm Frank Malico, KTVU, Fox 2 News. Thank you, Frank. Let's go ahead back uh, to the Lower Haight in San Francisco and take you back to Filetti Foods in the city there on Broderick Street. Sto uh, doors opened up here just a few minutes ago. The workers at this family-owned business are being treated these days more like celebrities and superheroes. Let's bring in KTVU's Claudine Wong to introduce us to some of the people who are keeping us fed there from that grocery store in the city. Good morning, Claudine. Good morning, Gase. Yes, Filetti's is like a family and certainly in the early days of this pandemic and our shelter in place and really to some extent still for people now, grocery store workers are the only people we were seeing on a regular basis. And so, I mean, we know we need them. They know it too. But honestly, being that essential isn't always easy. It's been a lifeline in this pandemic. The chefs are wonderful. I've been coming here for years. The grocery store has been the one place we know we can count on. I'm glad they're here because we need the food. Maybe the only place we've been able to go. With everything that's going on in the world, like they are being seen in a completely new light. Yes, if we didn't realize before how essential grocery workers are to our lives, we certainly do now. It's a term even they are getting used to. I've never had anybody in my whole life that I can recall tell me I'm essential. No, <laughs> never. I was like, we sell food. I was like, I just what my, my, my family's done for, you know, years. Valetti Foods has been in San Francisco since 1956, and the job looks different today. It does worry me. I mean, every day we're kind of, um, we're, we're coming into contact with hundreds of people. Today, we see the risks. They're just like us, just like medical people. They're high risk as well. It's why Ross monitors traffic flow and makes sure everyone wears a mask. I sell people at least 15 to 25, 30 times a day. On the weekend, it's crazier. It's why the meat department isn't Colin's only concern. I especially was going around doing extra stuff like sanitizing door handles. And it's why Jamie is still worried when she calls it a day. I have a, I have an 88 year old mother who I take care of too, that I have to wear a mask around her. Going to work these days is hard. Days are a lot more stressful and just heavier, like you feel heavier in general from it because the weight of everything bearing down on you. Every once in a while you do realize, you know, like once again, I'm 73 years old and I'm out here taking a risk. And while the world looks different through plexiglass, being here matters. They're so glad, you know, that we're working. Generally, a lot of the people are just depressed, you know, and I'm hearing that a lot from people that probably would never tell me that they were depressed. We're kind of the uh, the bartender now, <laughs> since you can't go to the bar and talk to your bartender. I'm glad to be able to uh, help anyone out, and we do appreciate all the thank yous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one. So, of course, an extra thank you. That helps. Being patient if supplies aren't there. That also helps. And of course, masks and social distancing both make a difference. It's all part of protecting ourselves and also protecting those essential workers, letting them and reminding them uh, know that we are all in this together. Sal? All right, uh, Claudine, thank you very much. From fancy dining rooms to assembly lines preparing takeout orders, we'll show you how some Bay Area restaurants have been adapting during the COVID-19 pandemic. Plus, even the worst cooks shouldn't fear their own kitchen. Gassia will chat with a local chef about the effort it takes to cook for your family and why mistakes aren't the end of the world.
Frontline food workers have really stepped up to the plate across the Bay Area when our communities needed it most. And KTV is so proud to highlight some of them. Today we are honoring Joe Giampaoli, owner of the Calmart Supermarket in San Francisco. Sylvia and Mike Harris wrote in to say Joe is their hero because, quote, as senior citizens and most vulnerable in the current pandemic, Joe has gone above and beyond for us. He has volunteered to shop for us every week. He brings not only what's on our list, but always adds fresh fruits and vegetables. He also includes treats, such as our favorite kind of ice cream and branded potato chips, all at no cost to us, despite our offers to pay. Congratulations! Like, I know a lot of you are relying on your grocery store to make food at home, and we are cooking an awful lot. I know you've seen this all over Instagram, from banana bread to babka. I had the chance to speak recently with Kenji Lopez-Alt. He's a chef, author, and partner at the San Mateo restaurant Worst Hall. We talked about why so many people are spending so much more time in the kitchen these days. Making pizza, making bread, and baking cookies seems to be like sort of universally appealing things for people. Why do you think that is? It feels like empowering to bake a loaf of bread, you know, because it's like a daily staple that people, most people buy. Um, and, and, and when you see these videos on YouTube saying, hey, here's how you can make a bread, people are like, oh, I can make bread. And then they do it and they're like, oh, I can make bread. You know, it, like it's one of those things I think helps people feel good about themselves and it's inexpensive. And it's, um, and again, it's like, you know, it's a, it's a fun project to do with kids. Um, it's like it's a very fam baking is very family friendly. Um, so I think it's appealing to the current situation we're in. Banana bread, I think the obvious reason is that people were overstocking stuff at home and bananas go bad when you have tons and tons of food. Um, and a good way to use them up is making banana bread. You know, I think baking projects in general are kind of inviting thing for families cooking at home. Um, especially when kids are home from school because baking is something that kids can really participate in. You know, dumping ingredients, measuring flour, mashing up bananas, all those things. So I think that explains the banana bread. As for the baking, um, I think, it, uh, again, just because people have more time now, you know, making a sourdough starter can take a couple weeks and then baking the actual loaf of bread can t is a, is a multi-day project, you know, um, even once you have that starter. So I think it's fun for people to have a, pro a long-term project now that they have a little bit of time at home. My big project recently was I made the babka from New York Times. It took uh -huh. three days and my boys devoured it in an hour, but it was <laughs> something I'd never tried before. That's the nature of cooking, right? You put in a ton of work and then it all disappears in a couple of minutes. <laughs> Kenji Lopez Alt says he's been getting a lot of response to his videos on YouTube. Hey, Bernice Kenji, uh, I'm making a grilled cheese. No fancy camera or kitchen crew, just a home cook with a GoPro. What I kind of want to sort of recapture with the videos I'm doing is that, you know, I grew up watching people like, um, well, like Julia Child and Jacques Pepin, even some of the early Food Network people, um, you know, they were doing everything live. They're talking to an audience, they're cooking this thing live, and they're messing up from time to time. It was a very loose feeling dough. A few weeks ago, I posted a video where I was making a pizza and it completely failed, you know, like it tore in half while I was putting it into the oven. And I still posted, you know, it still, still tasted fine. I still posted the video. Um, I think I called the video doesn't matter, still pizza, because with pizza, it doesn't really, like no matter what, it's going to be good. Um, but when I posted that, like people were like, Oh, like I, yeah, like I, I did that to my pizza last week. Like, like a lot of people came forward with stories of their own failures. Um, and, and a lot of people were saying, look, oh, it's so good to see you mess up because I did this exact same thing before. And now I don't feel so bad about doing it. Right. And Kenji says helping people feel OK about messing up is really almost more satisfying than showing them how to cook a really good meal. I showed you my bagels yesterday. I burned one to a crisp this morning. It's a charcoal briquette. It happens. Kenji says that cooking really is like riding a bike. You are going to fall or fail in the beginning. But once you get the basic skills you need to have confidence in your abilities, you can cook someone you love dinner. And you know what I say? If someone cooks you dinner, it means they love you. On the subject of dinner, I know it is early, but I have shared a story and my family's recipe for one of our family's favorite dishes online. It is, of course, shish kebab. And we've also talked about how my love of cooking started way back. So if you'd like to learn more about shish kebab and apple pie and why it is the perfect meal, head over to the Mornings on 2 page at KTVU.com and the KTVU mobile app. You know, South Castaneda, you're a big cook as well. Are there any family dishes that you're creating yourself now at home because your whole family can't all get together these days? Uh, yeah, well, I I've uh, learned how to make uh, my dad's enchiladas, uh, which are very good. And also, uh, during this pandemic, I've taken a little risks in the kitchen. I uh, got a little sous vide thing, so I'm sous vide uh, meats, and uh, I'm going to start grinding my own beef pretty soon. Uh, so, you know, I'm trying to get intricate because we're at home, Gasia, and Mike, uh, I'm at home. Uh, 
I don't get to go out. You know, uh, we get to take out sometimes, but we don't get mm -hmm. to go out and sit down. So I'm trying stuff. I am trying stuff. No, you guys have definitely stepped up your game. My game is, is still the same, which is no game at all when it comes to home cooking. Look, <laughs> uh, before the pandemic, I did cook a little bit here and there. But, you know, in the end, with my wife now home, you know, working from home, um, she doesn't really like me in the kitchen, which I respect. You know, she's like, just get out. I got it. And she's a wonderful <laughs> chef. So what do you say? I take a step back and let her go. Saying that, uh, she has definitely stepped up the game. I mean, the other day we had a pork tenderloin. She's trying different recipes. So uh, mm -hmm. it has been fun to see her in the kitchen doing this because uh, she loves it. It makes her happy and it makes the entire family happy, of course, when Mrs. Meebeck is happy. All right, coming up next right here on the Summer Zip Trip, your next meal on demand at your front door. We'll show you a company in San Francisco's North Beach that takes food delivery one step further for both recipients and business. But first, financial hardship during the pandemic is exponentially higher for people already struggling to make ends meet. We're gonna hear from the South Bay nonprofit working with hotels, stadiums, and other venues to make sure a single morsel does not go to waste. Another frontline worker deserving of recognition is Courtney Dam, an employee at Lucky's Grocery Store in Pinole. Now, Courtney, a woman named Lori, wrote in and says that you're her hero, quote, because she has not missed a single day of work amid the current pandemic. She is the most dedicated and positive employee you'll ever meet. You will never find a more happy and generous person than Courtney Thank you for all you do. Lori, wonderful words. And Courtney, from all of us here at KTVU, uh, Fox 2, thank you again for what you do there at L Lucky's in Pinole. All right, right now we want to highlight a South Bay uh, nonprofit that is changing the way it works to really help feed the people out there during this pandemic. Hunger at Home, that's the organization, typically gathers surplus food from hotels. We're talking about event centers as well as stadiums. Well, now it's providing meals to tens of thousands of people of employees who are currently out of work. And the founder and the chief executive of Hunger at Home is Yule Sterner. He joins us live this morning. Yule, good morning to you. Good morning. Thank you very much. No, of course. Look, I know you're doing wonderful things out there. So before I even ask you a question, I've got something to tell you right here, because I know you rely on a lot of donations, especially financial donations. And right now, out of the gate, uh, we are very happy to announce a $1,000 donation to your organization. And this $1,000, I just want to mention, comes from the Summer of Gordon led by Chef Gordon Ramsay. That show airs again Tuesdays and Wednesdays right here on KTVU, but you'll right out of the gate. Uh, it's a start and we're gonna be raising money for, throughout the day for you guys there, uh, but $1,000 coming your way uh, from the summer of Gordon. That's awesome, thank you. What a great way to start out. Yeah, no kidding, and we got more coming. Again, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, down a little you know, bit. when the pan nice. Hey, when the pandemic hit, uh, tell us how you had to change your model or basically how you had to operate differently. You bet. Well, normally, Hunger at Home, we operate through large stadiums, resorts, uh, different food and beverage industry, and we donate directly to the nonprofits. March 19th came, and it, everything has changed. So we became from a distribution to a major production. And those same entities from Levi Stadium, the Fairmont, Team San Jose that used to work with us throughout the year, now we're, we're furloughing and laying off their local 19 hospitality and communities. So immediately all the food that they had prepared for events and banquets and Facebook, they donated to Hunger at Home. We had tons of product coming in. And then naturally, next step, all of the distribution centers that donate to the hotel's hospitality, as they weren't having the requirement, we got large, huge, huge amounts of donations from distribution, Cisco, Fresh Point, uh, different entities. And then the third and final was local farm. Selena started to come through and they obviously had grown and prepared and and they support the distribution right. center so it went from hotels resorts to distribution to farms so those same hotels all the executive chefs hospitality executives that were furloughed came in and started yeah. to help us produce meals local 19 helped us to produce and to distribute so it became full circle to date we've done 420,000 meals produce and distributed to the local community since March 19th. Wow. I was going to ask you, you'll, uh, you know, just comparing and contrasting the demand, let's say back in January to the demand that you're seeing just last month or right now. 
oh my goodness, a complete shift. And the same individuals that were working in the hotels are now waiting hours in line for a food line, and for, for groceries, for substance for the week. And we've heard so many stories that if it wasn't for the opportunity to come in, there wouldn't be food. And the scary part is since January, we had tons of food coming up, tons of product. However, we weren't distributing. We weren't preparing and producing. So our model was changed from just supporting nonprofits to supporting community. And our, and our guideline is anyone in need. We're people helping people. We're getting a little excited back here, and it's because we're so happy to do what we do and to be able to support others. What about your reaction, Yule? I mean, when you see all these hundreds of vehicles lining up, um, do you get a chance to just sit back? I know you're busy, but do you get a chance to just sit back and, and watch this happening? And uh, and how does that make you feel? I feel absolutely blessed. And the fact that we can and we have the opportunity to support those in need, and we're not supporting just A segment or B segment. And it's very important to understand we're supporting community and people in need. So when I see signs, and it started out holistically March 19th, all of a sudden we're seeing signs, now banners, now individuals holding up saying, thank goodness for you, we're able to provide uh, substance for our family. So, And it makes you feel inside that you can provide a little bit of love, a little bit of hope for families that are suffering so much right now in so many ways. And a lot of the individuals coming through, my past job, I was a general manager at the convention center. My work partner was the executive chef at Levi's. And we're seeing the same team that we worked with for years coming through our line, also coming in and helping us to create and to prepare the meals and receive the meals. Awesome. Awesome. Hey, uh, Yule Sterner, founder and chief executive of Hunger at Home. Uh, you're an inspiration. And uh, thanks for joining us. Again, we are raising money for you, and uh, we're starting with that $1,000. Have a great rest of the day. Have a great weekend. Uh, a true inspiration, Yul. Thank you. And thank you. And remember to leave it better than you found it. We appreciate you. And again, all the support we can get from food donations to monetary donations, we appreciate. And thank you, KTV Youth Fox News. Hey, anytime, Yul. Thank you again. I appreciate it. Again, we are happy to announce that $1,000 uh, donation uh, to Hunger at Home. We aren't done with that yet. If you want to be able to donate or if you want to donate as well, uh, we do have a way for you to keep those donations coming. Just visit ktvu.com slash giving day anytime throughout the day today. Still to come on the Zip Trip, celebrating the power of community, Sal takes us to the North Bay to check in with a restaurant that turned its whole operation upside down. How Villette and other places like it adapted to new COVID-19 regulations. Then food on demand, how delivery services have really changed during the pandemic. And the one delivery company in North Beach that's going the extra mile while logging all of its regular miles. Welcome back to our special Zip Trip celebrating the power of community. This is Filetti Foods in San Francisco. The family-owned store has been feeding families for a long time, generations, and it's never been more important than during this coronavirus pandemic. I frequently have stopped at Filetti's. I have to say I'm away in the Golden Gate Park for a picnic. Boom, boom, you stop in Filetti's, you get some provisions and then you're on your way to Golden Gate Park. It's a great place uh, and uh, I'm glad it's still there. Uh, we also wanna give a shout out to Russ Cox of Dale Cox Distributing in Petaluma. Sean says his father-in-law is his hero because during the beginning of the COVID uh, outbreak, he was every day at 5.30 a.m. delivering food to grocery stores. Without his hard work and willingness to expose himself, many grocery stores in Moraine and Sonoma County would not have been stocked with adequate food supplies for those in need, Russ Cox, shout out to you and uh, good job there. Thank you. Thank you for uh, doing what you do. Well, today, a fine dining restaurant in Healdsburg will open up to in-person dining after weeks of doing only takeout. The restaurants are now beginning to come out of a very challenging time and still face hurdles as we get back to what they call this new normal. Things have changed for Villette, the rustic fine dining eatery in downtown Healdsburg. Because of the pandemic, the fancy dining room has become a place where the food is boxed and bagged, ready for to-go orders. Yes, look at this. Oh my gosh. When I last visited, I was able to go in, sit down, and try some of the delicious dishes created by Chef Dustin Villette and his staff. 
Now we met virtually as he explained how things are different. How does a restaurant make it through something like this? What have you had to do? You know, we have a lot of tenacity. <laughs> um, to be honest with you, I think the best part is honestly our community. It's, it is what gets me excited, what gets me out of bed in the morning. I mean, think about what we are. We're social creatures, man. We, we don't want to sit at home by ourselves. We want to hang out with our friends. We want to go have dinner together. We want to have a glass of wine together. We want to break bread together. And, you know, right now we can't do that, but we can in a very small micro way. We're able to produce food, people that kind of, you know, sit at home and experience Valette at your house, right? We do the Valette to go thing. And, you know, it, it really, in our mind, it gives people the ability to kind of not worry about the, the reality of what's going on out there in the world, but instead, just for an hour, half hour, 45 minutes, break bread together. On the menu this evening, a harista crusted whole Petaluma chicken with lemongrass and turmeric scented rice and grilled eggplant. Wine is also available to go and food is taken out to vehicles so people don't even have to get out. Vallette says even though restaurants, including his, will soon reopen to in-person dining, he understands some may still not want to go out. For this reason, he says his to-go meals will continue for the foreseeable future and in-person dining will include appropriate social distancing. And I think right now is where every restaurant is doing whatever they can to bring a sense of normalcy back to our daily lives. Norma Alvarez is one of Valette's longest employees. She says she's thankful for being able to work, especially since so many of her restaurant worker friends haven't been so lucky. They are working fewer hours and some have no work at all. Again, uh, tonight is the night there for uh, Healdsburg. Uh, Valets is going to open to in-person dining. Uh, I spoke with the chef. He's very excited. I think a lot of restaurant owners, Mike and Gassia, are excited about having uh, restaurant customers face-to-face. -face. It's going to be different. They're going to be spaced out. There's going to be new things to do. They're going to be some, you know, might even be taking your temperature, but it's something. And I think a lot of people are excited. Mike, I know that uh, you've been uh, doing takeout yeah. with some of your restaurants and you might actually might even want to go into uh, a place uh, that has appropriate social distancing. Yeah, you've been I mean, I've been craving it, you know, I mean, over the years, uh, my wife and I, who once worked in restaurants, you know, here in the Bay Area, you know, we've made a lot of relationships in that industry, good friends. In fact, I just got a message this morning from a friend who works at Sam's and says, hey, we're open, let's go, come out to the deck, you know, take a ferry over. And, uh, you know, you build those relationships. So yes, it's not, the restaurants are not just about the food and, and the delivery of it, and the execution of it, but it's about that relationship, Gassi. It's about interacting with those individuals and to think they've been unemployed, you know, for over the last few months. And I know a lot of people can't do it, and that's important to know it, but if you can, uh, it's important, Gassi, to get out and support these establishments that have been here in the Bay Area for so long. Absolutely. I mean, certainly if you have personal relationships with, you know, the owner of a restaurant or a longtime server there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for me, the thing I love when we do go out to eat is that I get to sit and, you know, kind of listen in on the conversation yeah. next to me or I get to, you know, wiggle my fingers at the cute baby across the way. It's just about people. You're having a communal experience. And even if you take that same great pad thai and have it delivered or, or, or bring it back to your house. The pad thai is great. For me, that's 50% of the equation. The other 50 plus is definitely the people who surround you as you're having it. So definitely going to make that a plan for my family very soon. Uh, let's talk about shopping for food and how that's changed. Many of us have had a, uh, definitely noticed that some prices for food items are going up. Some things such as flour were in very short supply at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. That's all beginning to change. The COVID-19 outbreak really has forced America to take a good hard look at its food supply chain and what's happening inside U.S. manufacturing plants. Many reports have said that people working in very close quarters in those manufacturing plants have suffered COVID-19 outbreaks. Let's talk more about our food and how it gets to our dinner table or to our restaurant by bringing in Anthony Chang, director of Kitchen Table Advisors. Thank you for being with us, Anthony. Thanks a lot for having me, guys. Yeah. It's great having you. You know, this pandemic has really forced me personally and all of us to examine where does that bag of flour come from before I grab it off the store shelf? Or what about that perfect New York strip that magically arrives on my plate at the restaurant? Absolutely. Sorry, Gassia, did you have, what was your question in there? Uh, I, I was just going to say, I think it's, it's, it's high time that we took a good hard look at the, the food supply chain in this country. 
Yeah, I absolutely agree. I mean, as we're seeing right now, in contrast to the risks that we see in long and global supply chains, um, what we're seeing in um, places that have shorter supply chains, farmers markets, local independent grocery stores, um, we're seeing more resilience um, and farmers stepping up, farmers working together to be able to do what they have been doing for a long time, um, which is um, grow healthy food and feed our, feed our communities. I've been going to farmer's markets for 15 plus years here in the Bay Area. Um, it was a different experience the first time I went after the COVID-19 pandemic. It was very quiet. It was very peaceful. There were a lot of restrictions in place, but my farmer's market was very much alive. Yes, absolutely. I go to our local farmer's market here um, in Mountain View every Sunday morning. Um, and F Absolutely. I think you're just having another conversation around community um, and people and kind of I think the farmers and the farmers market managers have done a good job of keeping us all safe with social distancing guidelines and masks and all of those things. Um, but yes, I think that farmers and community members are just like are wanting to be able to have know where their food comes from and be able to have that kind of more secure um, line um, to good, healthy food. And at the same time, it's the community and the resilience that we can find in this community that is um, so important, kind of giving hope and inspiration in this time. For many people, a farmer's market is sort of the perfect all day Saturday outing. For other people, it is a complete luxury to think of making a special trip, to go to the farmer's market, you know, maybe pay $8 for a, a dozen perfect eggs, you know, from the farmer. Um, how do you suggest that people who do not have the luxury of either time or finances or transportation to still support local farmers and get the best food for themselves and their families? Absolutely. There's a lot of ways to support local farmers beyond going to the farmer's market, which is a great option. I can offer three. Um, one is CSAs or community supported agriculture Two our mutual aid efforts and three are local independent grocery stores that have relationships with farmers. Um, so our family gets a CSA against community supported agriculture, which is a weekly um, box of organic vegetables that gets delivered to our neighbor's house. In the last three months, we've seen the number of boxes that we go pick up go from like 10 to 12 per week to 50 or 60 per week. So it's a great relation way to have a relationship with the local farm um, if you can't go to the farmer's market. Um, a second, seen a lot of community-driven mutual aid efforts. Um, I know a woman in San Francisco that's going volunteering to go to the farmer's market once a week to buy produce for five or 10 families and deliver it to their homes. Um, also know that uh, the couple in Silicon Valley that's organized dozens of families to essentially do a buying club um, to work with um, a couple of small organic farms in San Juan Batista. So people have the opportunity to band together with their family, friends, neighbors, um, to participate in something, to initiate something like this or participate in something that might be already existing in your community. Oh, and the last thing on local independent grocery stores, um, there are many in the Bay Area that have direct relationships with small family farms. And so folks are, are curious, ask questions about where their produce is coming from and support the grocers that are buying directly from farms. That's another way that you can support kind of our local farm community. What's the number one change you'd like to see for, your, for, for the industry coming out of this pandemic? That is a big question, guys. Yeah, um, I think that there's there's a couple things on, on a couple different levels. I mean, I think seeing folks, seeing farmers and farm workers and that um, as essential workers and that compassion, and empathy, I think is super important. Um, and at the end of the day, um, you know, 80 to 90 percent of agricultural labor in this country are Latino immigrants um, and many of them in undocumented and mixed status families, many um, underpaid and undervalued, especially in big agriculture. And so if we, you know, one of the things that I want to see is real respect and dignity for the people who grow our food, for the farmers and the farm workers. And that will require really, really big structural change in our society. Um, it's talking about affordable housing for everyone and universal health care. Um, and um, also things like um, immigration reform, ending police violence in black and brown communities so, and investing in community care. These are the kinds of, you know, they're big things, but they, these are the kinds of things that will bring deg dignity and respect to these um, important folks in our community that are growing our food. Every time we pop a strawberry from Watsonville uh, in our mouth, I tell my boys, someone picked that berry, treat it well. Thank you so much, Anthony Chang, Director of Kitchen Table Advisors for joining us today. Thanks so much. Uber Eats, Postmates, DoorDash, they've all been thriving during this pandemic as takeout orders have really spiked over the last few months. But saying that, those services also take a healthy cut of the pie. Frank Malico back with us once again this morning. And Frank, there is one food delivery service out there that is 100% free, and it's also getting some pretty good reviews. 
Boy, is it ever, Mike. It's terrific. It's called North Beach Delivers. It's now in its eighth week, and it's really given some San Francisco restaurants uh, a big lip when they needed it the most. I spoke with her founder, Danny Sauter, about all of its success and how it all works. North Beach Delivers is a program that we started where each week we feature a different restaurant. And the key is that we're actually providing them a, a team of volunteers to do the delivery free of charge for them. So we equip our volunteers with e-bikes and with protective equipment. And we're actually taking all the orders from the restaurant out to the community, out to the neighborhoods. And it's grown now, we're in our eighth week. And each week we're providing the restaurant with maybe 40 or 50 orders. It's always been the, the biggest night uh, that they've had since the, the pandemic started. And, um, and it's really grown. It's been a really exciting uh, volunteer driven effort. All right, so if I'm a, a viewer out there and I live in the North Beach area and I wanna take part, how do I do it? Sure, so each week we put up the menu for the restaurant and that's at northbeachdelivers.com. And we've actually expanded now. So we're doing deliveries to Russian Hill, Chinatown, all along the Embarcadero. Um, so you just go each week and we've got a menu on there. You select what you want, you select when you want it delivered. We give you a half hour window uh, and we'll drop it off. We're doing Thursday night deliveries each week. And I bet the restaurants love you guys. What's been the reaction? Yeah, it's been, it's been really positive. I mean, restaurants are going through really difficult times right now. So just to have one evening of positivity is so fantastic. Um, you know, we're averaging now where we can give them about $2,000 in incremental revenue each week because of this, because the community has been so supportive. It's the biggest night. Um, and it's been, uh, it's just been so wonderful to see some of these places open back up. It's a short term fix, but it's a shot in the arm. And honestly, that's, um, that's so needed right now. They'll take all those short term fixes that they can get. Absolutely. And how about the volunteers? Who are these wonderful what? people? Yeah, the volunteers are coming from all corners of the community. And we started with four or five weekly. We're now to the point where we're getting uh, eight or 10 or 12 each week and um, people of all ages people of all backgrounds and just people really looking to do something tangible each week to help. And, um, you know, they're volunteering a few hours, they're getting a lot of exercise. Sometimes they're walking, sometimes they're hopping on bikes. Um, but, uh, it's something positive that they can do right now. It's something they can actually contribute to. And occasionally get fed maybe. Yes. Yes. Uh, very <laughs> often there will be, the restaurants will be generous and, and give us some of the food and, you know, we have to do some of that taste testing too, to make sure it's good. And it's always great. <laughs> Of course they do. That is uh, one of the fringe benefits. Danny also tells me North Beach Deliver has raised over $11,000 in their eight weeks for the restaurants. And by the way, if the driver gets tipped delivering the food, all that money goes back uh, to the restaurant as well. So it's definitely 100%. He also told me, Danny said it's been such a huge success. Once the pandemic has come and gone and it can't happen soon enough, they will continue the service, helping out one restaurant a week in San Francisco. That's the very latest. I'm Frank Malico. Sal, we'll send it to you. All right, Frank, thank you very much. Up next, it's excruciating trying to keep your cafe or restaurant going during this pandemic, but what about building one from scratch? I'll chat with a local nonprofit that works to ensure women of color get just that chance. Plus, we're going to wine country Mike chats with the owner of a small winery run by a big family about the challenges of operating during the COVID-19 pandemic. Our frontline food workers have been helping everyone stay stocked up on essential goods. Today, we're honoring Armando Castellanos. He works at the Safeway in Oakland's Fruitvale Diamond District. Shauna Flower says her son is her hero because he manages to complete his shift all the while making the customers feel safe and appreciated, always with a smile and a, how you doing? He is my hero for life. Armando, nice work. All right. A San Francisco nonprofit uh, is working to build equity and business ownerships for women, immigrants, and people of color. In particular, it helps small businesses in the food industry realize their dreams. Let's bring in Emiliana Puyana, the group's program manager, to chat about La Cocina. And Emiliana, thank you for being here. Uh, La Cocina is uh, probably just like every other entity experiencing some challenges 
during COVID-19? What are those challenges? Yeah, thank you so much for having us here. Um, I mean, there's so many really, uh, but first and foremost that, you know, our industry has been totally disrupted uh, and people's ability to earn a living and the traditional channels by which they accessed, uh, you know, sales opportunities are, are at the moment all but gone. So I, I wanted to ask you because, you know, starting a small business is already hard enough. And especially for people who uh, you may not have the resources, how do you help them and what extra things have you had to do during this time? Yeah, I mean, so we we support people first in generating a, an idea and flushing out that idea and concept. And then uh, we support them in the process of formalizing the food the, their food businesses that uh, obviously includes getting the right permits that, that are needed and uh, you know, kind of finding uh, access to capital. So how much money do they need to formalize and what do we, where can we find that money? And then we uh, provide them access to affordable commercial kitchen space and lastly access to uh, sales opportunities. Um, you know, that's been really, really hard to come by at this particular moment in time. You know, we're, we're lucky that we uh, have our shared commercial kitchen space and we can make that at the moment available to our entrepreneurs for free to mitigate some of the costs of running a business uh, when, when the revenues have been so greatly reduced. Um, so that's one of the ways we've also created a community food box. So anybody in and around the Bay Area can go on our website and order a food box uh, for a family of, of uh two or a family of four, and it's made up of really delicious foods from all over the world. You know, my grandmother made uh, tamales and uh, just, uh, you know, pupusas and that kind of stuff. And she sometimes would, you know, give them to relatives or maybe under the table, sell them. So this actually is something that, you know, if you have a, a woman or a man or whoever who is making tamales or something like that, and they think, wow, these are good. I could get a business going you can help them do that, right? Yeah, I mean, that's exactly what we're what we do. And we were born out of the informal, uh, thriving informal economy in the Mission District. You know, that's that's uh, a way in which people have earned a living in our city for, for a long time. It's a way that I hope people continue to earn a living, but also for folks who want to formalize that and and have a little bit more security as as to uh, sort of where their next paycheck is coming from or even grow that to the next level, then that's that's what we're here to do. And that's what we hope to do. Emiliana, real quick, how can people become more aware of, uh, you know, maybe they can go to your website, aware of these small businesses that you're helping to prop up. How can they find, can they just come to your website and, you know, find businesses like this? Yeah, absolutely. So all the information that folks will need in order to support businesses is right on our website. I mean, we, you know, uh, by going on there, you'll see a list of all of our businesses, graduates and current businesses, where you can find them. We can redirect you, redirect you towards their websites. You know, we'd love to say at La Cocina that uh, folks have three opportunities a day to make an impact, to vote with their dollar. And for us, those opportunities are breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And particularly in a time like, like that we're in, today, um, it's important to sort of put our money worth our where our mouth is and support the sort of businesses that represent the sort of diversity we want to see in the world. All right, Emiliana Puyana of La Cocina, thank you so much for joining us. You're doing good work and thanks for being on Morning Town too. Awesome. Thank you so much. Have a good one. All right, today is a very big day, especially in Sonoma County, because tasting rooms can open six feet of hard, but they don't have to serve food, right? That was a stickler for especially the smaller wineries who never did that in the first place. Look, at the overall picture of wine region across the Bay Area, Santa Cruz, Livermore, Napa, Sonoma counties, the big boys, right? Your major wineries, your Mondavis, your Carneros, Opus, Stag's Leap, more likely they're going to be okay. But those smaller wineries we're talking about, uh, it has been a tough fight to stay afloat, and it's going to be a tough fight for the next year if not longer. On Rama Cellars, a small Napa Valley winery with a big heart, a big family, all fueled by a husband and wife with a passion for the grape and for the glass. 80% of our business has been impacted, definitely. definitely. Miriam Puentes says she and husband Juan Jose started the winery back in 2008. Here we are 12 years later living through a pandemic and like many small wineries, they're struggling to stay open. Percentage of people that are gonna be scared to come back to Napa or go into tasting rooms. And then we are so small that um, the only way I'm gonna be able to, 
to really maintain and differentiate myself with the statistics that are going on about wine sales in the wine industry um, are going to be to personally attend my tasting room seven days a week. This has been extremely detrimental to everybody, large and small, wineries, hotels, um, restaurants, shops, etc. So, it, you know, it's been devastating. Lindsay Gallagher is president and CEO of Visit Napa Valley. Gallagher says pre-pandemic tourism revenue for Napa County, $2.2 billion. Cut that by 70% and the county's looking at about $1.5 billion in losses for the year. So to promote the winery, small and large, Visit Napa Valley is doing things it's never done before. We don't proactively advertise during this time period. We will be doing that for the first mm. time and really trying to rebuild visitation um, to this valley overall, to our wineries and restaurants and hotels. Another thing that we're doing is helping to promote road trips within the valley. Some people, you know, come and they always go maybe to Yachtville, but have never been to Calistoga, or they always come to downtown Napa and haven't explored St. Helena or American Canyon. And so I think, you know, one of the opportunities for us coming out of this is to make sure that people know that we're a, a valley of five towns with so many off the beaten path, hidden gems, great things to explore. Even if you've been here many times, we have hundreds of wineries that you may not have seen. And so we're going to try to help encourage people to come visit us, explore their own backyard, but get off the beaten path um, in addition to, to the tried and true uh, wonderful experiences that we always uh, are able to provide. Miriam Puentes says the family is strong and still has the drive and the faith, but she knows it may take more than working seven days a week in order to get back to pouring her cab and her rosé, her pinot, to all of those who once came to visit before. Oh my God, we have great faith. Our faith is big, but we do have roller coaster moments. I had a meltdown a couple days ago <laughs> where I'm just like, my goodness, we still have to pay our mortgages. We still have to stay afloat. We still have bills that are coming in. Rama is part of saving, saving the family farms here in Napa. And we are also are part of MAVA, the Mexican American Vintners Association. So amongst the two organizations, we are all putting our heads together to how we're gonna get past this and work with each other and do business with each other. And hopefully not, not go under, continue to, to keep our legacy and our hard work going. Hey, those tasting rooms are huge, especially for those smaller wineries. Uh, you know, most of their bottle sales actually take place in those tasting rooms. So uh, they're not in restaurants compared to the bigger uh, wineries out there. Also, I asked Visit Napa Valley, like when did they expect to get back to that $2.2 billion in tourism revenue that they were having pre-pandemic? And Lindsay said it's going to be about two years. Uh, Gassia, I recommend everyone when they do go wine tasting, it, and this is a tip I pass along. If you go to one of the bigger ones, I always pull an employee aside, you establish that relationship. And I ask them because usually they're local. I say, hey, what's the one, you know, off the road, the smaller one that you recommend that's a great tasting. They'll offer it up. And usually that tasting is not only cheaper, but sometimes it's better. Nice. You can feel so good spending that money. All right. Stay with us uh, more on our food zip trip after this. Thank you for joining us on the Zip Trips. Uh, we're going to do another one in two weeks. I hope you enjoyed it, and we look forward to you seeing you on June 26th. Goodbye now.